In this environmental and resource economics video, I'm going to talk about supply and supply curves and their origins, which is in production functions and production costs and particularly marginal costs. So let's get into it. So what is a production function? Well, formally, it's really this expression or a equation or a formula uh, that relates the quantity of different factor inputs, those are the things that we use to produce different goods, to the amount of output that is produced from those. So you can kind of think of it maybe like a recipe for producing something, but in this case we're not producing grandma's cookies here, we're producing a ton of wheat or a roll of steel or a gigawatt of electricity, that type of thing. So when economists talk about production functions, they really break them down time-wise into short-term and long-term, or short-run and long-run. So in the short-run, um, things are more hard to be changed, more difficult to change. So imagine you build a factory, it's full of machines, it's pretty easy to add more people, but you know the factory is pretty full, it's not exactly easy to double the amount of production by simply doubling the amount of machines, presumably, because there's not enough space and other things. So in the short run, there's limits on the amount of changes to many of the fixed kind of items. Uh, whereas in the long run, we really consider pretty much everything's on the table. So you can build another factory, relocate to another country, those types of things. So let's have a look at a specific example of a production process. And in this case, I want you to consider producing pallets, really wooden crates that we, you know, put things on so that we can transport them around. So of course we need logs and we'll have to take the bark off of those, sort them all out, get rid of that waste bark, mulching and so on. Uh, and then we go through a series of processes within a, a mill to um, chop those up and into different lengths and uh, different qualities and so on. So you can see this mill is optimized for different stations of people sorting and grading and cutting and uh, operating different types of tools and machinery to produce the pallets in the end, which you can see they're doing here. So in the short run, you can imagine that it would be hard to simply double production if everybody's going at full capacity already because there's just not much more room for more machines and that type of thing. But of course in the long run, then we could do that more easily. So let's have a look then about how we would express that in a form and a kind of graph. All right, so this graph here um, on the top up here is the total product graph and on the bottom here we've got average and marginal product. So let me walk you through that. So on the vertical axis of both of these I have output, that's the number of kilograms or the total quantity, the otherwise the volume of output uh, of whatever this particular product is. So let's imagine it's pallets. So we've got numbers of pallets that are produced and, uh, and then on this uh, horizontal axis is the um, one of the factors of production. Of course, there could be lots of different factors, but what I have here is one of the factors, which is labor. So you can think uh, we would have different factors of production like raw materials, the wood, electricity, uh, labor, all these other things. I'm just looking at one of them here. So I'm looking at labor. So when we have, uh, when we produce one of these curves, we assume that all of the other factors of production are fixed and the only thing that we're varying is this particular factor of production and that is labor. So I'm going on the bottom axis here from zero amounts of labor, that is zero workers, all the way up in this direction to more and more workers. And that is the same thing as what's occurring here on the bottom of the diagram. So what is actually happening then as we add more labor? Well, you can imagine that uh, without any workers in the factory, everything's sitting idle. The machines aren't turning, there's nobody delivering the lumber there, there's nobody debarking it or slicing it up or making the pallets. So the instant we, that we add the first person, then we can finally presumably get some output, some pallets from that operation. But you have to imagine then that person would have to drive the truck in, unload it themselves, and then move it um, from one location to the other, cut it up and, and take it through that whole operation, which would be time consuming and would require quite a lot of skills and knowledge on that person's, uh, that that person would have to have. 
So in fact, what we find is that as we keep adding um, labor, initially one worker, two worker, three workers, and so on, we get these big gains in output. And so you can see that here, that we're adding workers here and output is increasing exponentially. And that's reflected in this curve down here at the bottom. I want you to look at this curve here, which is the marginal product curve. Now the marginal product is the change in output that arises from increasing the variable factor of production, in that case this is labor, by one unit. So how much total output uh, is increased when we increase labor by one unit. So you can see here that uh, this is the total output here. Right? So you can think about this as the marginal product is the productivity of each individual person if you put them all in order of adding them to the factory. So the first worker has this initial marginal product here. The second worker, you can see, has a higher marginal product. And the, basically the concept here is that um, as workers come, they can assist each other. They can specialize into different areas. You can have a forklift driver, somebody operating the machine, somebody working the accounts upstairs and doing the phone calls, somebody driving the truck. And so as we add more and more units of labor, each additional unit of labor actually has a higher marginal product than the one before it. So that's where you can see this marginal product, product is increasing up like this. And that is why in total product terms, the total product is increasing exponentially here. So remember, the marginal product is the unit by unit uh, contribution uh, of uh, each additional unit of labor to the output. And this is the total amount of output. So probably a couple things to notice here that uh, the increase, this increase in labor, the marginal product of labor, doesn't actually just keep going on and on and on up in this direction. In fact, it goes up to a certain amount here and then peaks out and then begins to drop off. So what's the concept behind that? Effectively, what that's saying is that you reach this sort of optimum point here after which adding each additional unit of labor still increases output, as you can see up here. This is output. Right, I'm increasing labor and it is still going up, but less than the previous unit of labor, right? So that person that you've added here was not quite as productive or did not quite contribute the same amount to total production as the person before, and this person is even lower, and this person is even lower. So this whole little section here, we call diminishing marginal productivity. That's this concept of diminishing marginal productivity. And what that's really saying is that after a certain point, um, you know, it's just getting pretty crowded in the factory. There's not too much for new people to do. All the forklifts are busy. Every station in the mill is busy. Um, the office upstairs is full. All the phones are taken. So adding additional labor after that point really does not increase total output very much. So here, if you can look in my video here, we can see a bunch of people just wondering what they're going to do. Uh, they're at work, but we're paying them. They're not really adding much to productivity. So that whole concept then diminishing marginal productivity is really key to understanding um, costs and the costs associated with production. Now, before I move on, I'll just mention about this average product here as well. So what is the average product? The average product is the total amount of output divided by the total number of workers. And you can see it's a little bit different than, than the marginal one, right? The marginal one's going up here. This is the unit by unit contribution, and this is the average. So how do they relate to each other? And why, for instance, how can you tell, you know, which is above the other and which is going up and down and so on? Well, one way I like to think about it is maybe imagine if you were in a room, a room full of people, and you were interested in taking the average height of all of the people in that room. So imagine you're in a classroom right now, and you wanted to figure out the average height of that classroom. You would measure all of the individual people, and you would divide it by the total number, and you would get the average. Now, imagine you open the door, and somebody walks in, and what, how will that affect the average? Well, imagine you opened up the door and it was, you know, a small child and they turned out to be quite a bit shorter than everybody else in the room. So because they're shorter, they're going to bring down the average. So you can think about 
when that marginal person is below the average, the average is going to fall, and that's this case over here, right? Whereas if you open up the door and a basketball player who's seven feet tall walks in, it's going to bring up the average. So when the marginal is above the average, it's bringing the average up. And you can see then that the marginal crosses the average curve right at its top there, or the bottom if it's a um, shape in the other direction. And so what that's really saying is that um, if the marginal is exactly equal to the average, as it would be right here, well then there's no change in the average. So let's hold that thought over, and I'd just like to, to take you through this next concept on production functions. And that is their relationship to cost functions. So I indicated at the beginning I was going to go through productivity and production functions and then relate those to marginal costs. So I've just covered marginal productivity, right? This idea that we have this initially increasing uh, productivity with each unit of labor added, uh, but then when it reaches, oh, I'm sorry, this one here, then it reaches a peak and then begins to fall. So how does that relate to costs? Well, you can imagine you have to pay for those workers. And so the total, I mean, the cost then associated with each of those workers then is a little bit different because they're not all producing the same amount uh, of additional output uh, for each unit that we're adding there. So let me just add a table to explain this in a bit more detail. So in this table, then I have output, which is going to be you know zero units, one unit, two up to six here. I have the variable costs, and that could include uh, particularly labor in this case, but in other instances it might be electricity or other um, variable inputs. Then I have fixed costs here. And so you can think about fixed costs as, for instance, things that we'll have to pay for even if that factory isn't running. So the forklift, we already bought it. If it runs, well, we're gonna to have to put fuel in it, but otherwise we still have that purchase price that we outlaid or um, managerial salaries and some other things like that. Uh, bank loans, we have to pay those. So they are fixed costs and they're unrelated to the total quantity of output, right? So if it, uh, for instance, if we're adding fuel to the, to the tank to run the forklift, that's a variable cost. If it's the cost of the forklift itself, it's a fixed cost. So in this case, we're talking about the um, output here on the bottom, and you may notice that difference here. Up here, I have output and units of labor. Here I have, um, this is output, right? So increasing pallets here, if I'm still speaking about that on the bottom, and then costs, which are up this vertical axis. So the costs start up here because there's fixed costs, right? So I'm still deriving this marginal cost curve and an average cost curve. Uh, the costs start up here because there's fixed costs uh, that are going to occur regardless of how much we produce. So let's look at what those are. So right here I have uh, for my output when I've got zero, I have fixed costs of 10. I'm just using simple numbers here for this example. So I have a total cost of 10. Well, I haven't added any labor to this yet, so I don't have any marginal average cost that can be worked out. So let's start with the first one here, which is that single uh, first unit of output. Well, I've got a variable cost of 10 here, fixed cost of 10, and then my total cost then is 20, which is the addition of those two. So what is the marginal cost? Well, as I said before, just like the marginal product is the um, amount of additional output that would occur when we add one more unit of labor, the marginal cost is the additional cost that will incur for producing one more unit of output. So here you can see I've gone from zero to 10, so my marginal cost is 10. My average cost actually is a little bit higher, and you might notice that I've got a total cost of 20 here, and if I divide that by one, because I've only got one unit, then my average cost is 20 there. Okay, so what about the marginal cost for two? So now um, you know, I've got my variable cost here, plus my fixed cost equals my total cost. What is the difference? I've gone from one unit to two units. What is the difference in the total cost there? It's gone from 20 to 27, so my marginal cost there is seven. Uh, and so that would be over on here on the graph. So you can notice that initially, the, out, um, the marginal costs are 
initially falling, and that relates to up here, how you get these um, gains from specialization and those increasing marginal productivity. Uh, but then they peak out, right? Here, marginal product peaks out, and here, marginal costs are at their lowest point, and then after that, they start to increase, and you can see that right here, right? So marginal costs start at 10, go down 7, and then they start to increase again up in this direction. And you can see actually in this case they've gone up quite quickly. So that uh, really is this whole concept of uh, diminishing marginal product of a one of the factors of production leads to increasing marginal costs. And in fact that really relates to the supply curve. So the supply curve then, as I'll explain more in just a minute, is in fact this upward sloping section of the marginal cost curve, technically, you know, above the average cost here, that bit there is uh, what we refer to as the supply curve. So let me explain that more. Oops, let's go with that. So uh, like I explained in the demand video, um, there is marginal and total, and here's just a different way maybe to think about it. So here I have the marginal cost of producing one unit, marginal cost of producing second unit, third unit, fourth unit, and so on. So I have the same, like I had with the demand curve where I had marginal willingness to pay um, and um, total willingness to pay. Here I've got uh, marginal cost of production and total cost. So for instance, I could say, what is the total cost of producing four units? And I would add up the marginal cost of that, and two, and three, and four, and that's five plus seven plus 10 plus 15 equals 37. So the total cost of producing four units of output here is $37. Whereas the marginal cost of producing the fourth unit, I come over here to the, oops, come over here to the fourth unit, and come up to there and over to the vertical axis there and I can see that that's $15. So once again the marginal cost is the change in the total cost that results from a one unit change in the quantity of output. And uh, you will want to note then that if it's an additional cost if production is increasing and it's a savings if production is decreasing, right? If we're going from here to here you can see that we're actually avoiding some costs there. All right, so let's look at the supply curve or marginal cost curve in a little bit in more detail. So why is it upward sloping and how does it relate to how much firms uh, would want to supply into the market? So like the demand curve was, I, would, I told you it's best maybe to see it as a combination of different points that relate a particular uh, level of demand to a particular price. Similarly, the supply curve then is a collection of points, think of it that way, a collection of points with a line through it that represent the amount of supply uh, or amount of output that a firm will produce and sell into a market at a particular price, right? So why, or, you know, so why does it have this upward shape? Well, there's really two reasons why it is the supply curve. And the first is that there's an incentive when the price is higher for firms to redirect resources to uh, provide additional supply. So when the price is higher, they can make more money at it. And you might think if they're producing a number of different goods, then uh, they want to make the maximum amount possible. And so they would redeploy resources from um, production of goods that aren't producing you know, very much money towards those that have a much, much higher price. And uh, imagine this, if I were to say, you know, I'm sure there's probably not too many of us that produce bananas in our backyards, but perhaps if the price of a kilogram of banana was a thousand dollars, you know, you might imagine we'd start to consider getting into the supply of bananas ourselves. It's just very profitable and there's an opportunity cost if we don't do it. Or alternatively, you purchased a ticket to a concert and ended up being one of the lucky people that got it before it sold out in, you know, five minutes. When all of those tickets go up on eBay and they're selling for 500 or or $1,000, something like that, all of a sudden you might reconsider and say, well, 
you know, that's a pretty excellent price. And you would go from consuming, that is going to the concert, to being a provider, a supplier, uh, adi- you know, essentially providing additional supply into the market because of that higher price. So the first thing then about why the, you know, why at a higher price uh, firms supply more is because of their willingness. And the second thing is ability. So ability means that at a higher price, the firm can cover additional costs and specifically the marginal costs, right? So you've got to think that these marginal costs here are rising like this. So if the price, um, you know, let's say that there's a price of fifteen dollars there well that firm could cover the cost of the fourth unit but it can't cover the cost of the fifth unit there which is 25 so as the price goes up past 25 then the firm can uh, is willing to provide that fifth unit because they can cover the costs so those are really the main two reasons there for the um, nature of the slope and of the supply curve so like the demand curve supply curves also have elasticity that is a slope to them so here you can see i've got two examples of two different supply curves and just like the demand curves there's obviously going to be hundreds thousands unimaginable amounts of different supply curves for every different type of product that we can imagine producing so on this left hand uh, graph here i have quite a steep upward sloping supply curve and i would call that Um, less elastic or more inelastic and this one is flatter and we'll call that more elastic so what does it mean when the supply curve is steeper like that what does it mean when the supply curve is steeper uh, like this well really what that's saying is that what happens to the total quantity of output supplied to the market by this firm uh, or by the market as a whole uh, when the price rises so you can see if I have a price rise here of this amount, and it's the same on each of these two graphs, well then how does that relate to the quantity of output provided? So in this one, when it's really steep, you can see there's not much of an increase in the amount of output uh, for that particular price rise, but in this one, there's quite a large increase in the quantity of output. So that's the basis really of this concept of elasticity. If the price rises and output can Uh, increase rapidly as we see in the second diagram here that's more elastic and I guess it's best to think about that like different types of firms a firm with a highly you know inelastic supply curve like this faces great difficulty in increasing the amount of supply even if the price goes up and there could be lots of different reasons for that you might imagine the um, factor inputs the raw materials are difficult to obtain Uh, So it's just not easy, even if they want to produce more, um, it's just very difficult to actually obtain those materials. Whereas in this case, uh, quite easy really to increase the overall output. Or this may have severe constraints in the factory that just don't allow them to to put out any more than they currently are without quite a lot of extra cost, which would require a big price increase to cover it. Okay, like the demand curves, it's also possible to aggregate supply curves. So let's look at how that would happen. So on the bottom here, I have three different um, companies that are producing seafood. Let's imagine that they're producing fish of some kind. And I'm interested to know uh, how much, you know, overall supply or aggregate supply of fish is provided into this market. So how would we aggregate these up? Well, first of all, we've got our standard supply curve um, set up, which is to have the, the price, or, which is also kind of in the background, the cost here on this axis, and on the bottom, the quantity of output. So on this uh, first one here, I have Deep Blue Fish Limited, and uh, that's their marginal cost or, mar- or supply curve. And similarly here, we've got one for Pacific Seafoods and one for Horizon Seafoods. And I want to add those all together to produce the sector-wide, the market supply curve. So how do I do that? Well, what we do here is actually look at a particular price. And so, for instance, at $5 and ask the question, how much would these different companies provide into the market at $5? So if I come across here, 
for deep blue fish, I can see that at a price of $5, they're willing to supply three. Uh, and I can come across to Pacific Seafoods and see, oh, at a price of $5, they're not willing to supply anything. So that's kind of interesting. So you can see that their supply curve, their marginal cost curve is above uh, $5, so they're not willing to provide anything. Now, if I keep going over here, I can see that at a price of $5, Horizon Seafood is willing to provide five. So I add together three, zero, and five, so eight, and, and I mark that off here. So I create a point, essentially, over here. Um, you know, price five, quantity eight, make a point there. And then I do that again, all the way up for each of these different prices here. So similarly, at a price of 15, I can see that Deep Blue Fish is going to provide 10. Now Pacific Seafood's in there too, and they're going to provide 15. And Horizon's going to provide 18. So at a price of 15 altogether, the market's willing to provide um, 43 kilograms, units, whatever it is of fish that uh, we're discussing here. So I do that for each of those different prices here to create all of these points. I join them together. That's how I aggregate up individual firm supply curves into an aggregate market supply curve. So similar to demand curves, there can be, uh, I think it's important to really note, there can be movements along the curve and shifts in the curve. So I've already described the elasticity of the curve and I've really tried to emphasize you should view these uh, demand and supply curves as being you know, a connection, a collection of points uh, that relate uh, a particular amount of supply being provided at a particular price, right? So any change in price will lead to a movement along the supply curve. That is, if the price changes and the quantity changes, it's a movement along the supply, the supply curve. Price goes up, you know, from here up to here, and the quantity supplied increases, right? A movement along that supply curve, similarly if it goes down. But the curve itself can also shift inward or outward, and sometimes that might seem like up or down um, because of the steepness of the curve. But anyway, we're going to call this an outward shift or a downward shift in the supply curve here. So what would be some of the different reasons that would cause the supply curve to shift? Well, let's have a look at what is actually happening when it does shift to give us some sense of that. So here you can see that this is S1, that's my initial supply curve, and then it goes to S2. So what that's saying is that at S1 on the initial supply curve at a price of $16, uh, there was you know, just more than 10 units of, let's call it fish, uh, supplied into the market. And now with the shift in supply curve at that same price, there's you know almost 17 uh, kilograms of fish provided into the market. So at the same price, more supply. So that's an example of an outward shift in the supply curve. Or uh, you might look at it this way, which is uh, for a particular quantity, that quantity is now getting a higher price, right, from here to here. So what would cause shifts in the supply curve? Well, there could be a lot of different things. So if, imagine, for example, we're talking about the production of wheat so the, or rice or those types of things. Well, those um, one of the factors of production of wheat, along with seeds and soil and labor and technology, would be sunlight and rain. And so those factors of production are quite difficult for us to control. Of course, we can have you know, a bit of uh, irrigation and so on, but overall the weather is a big determinant of many of our crops and how much total product we're gonna get from them, how much total output disease, uh, those types of things can really affect output. So you might imagine if there's a really excellent growing condition, sunny weather, rain at the perfect time and so on, we get a bumper crop, you know, the supply curve can shift out at the same price. Um, we'll have more total supply. Another reason can be uh, changes in technological improvements. For example, uh, of course, you can imagine, you know, all of the advances that go on all the time in producing uh, chips for computers or solar panels and so on, how those costs are falling. So we develop new methods of uh, manufacturing that are less expensive to produce the same amount of an output 
and then you can see that that's really shifting the marginal cost curve down. So remember these are marginal cost curves too. So what that's saying is that at any particular price, uh, we're now, you can see at you know, the same price here, the marginal cost would be lower because of the uh, technological improvement, right? So uh, that company or the market as a whole would be willing to provide more supply uh, because it can cover those costs now, those marginal costs. Another reason for a shift in the supply curve would be changes in the cost of inputs. So you can imagine uh, raw materials, if it's logs for the pallets, or it's the price of labor, or it's the price of electricity, all of those types of things collectively go to uh, add up to, to be the cost of production for these different goods. So if any one of them goes up, you can imagine that uh, the overall price uh, sorry, overall, you know, the overall price of the good has to increase to cover these additional costs. So if the, uh, for instance, if the cost of labor went down, and maybe you're thinking about, okay, we've, you know, relocated this operation to somewhere in Asia from Australia, our labor's cheaper now, you know, that would represent a downward shift in the supply curve. Uh, or maybe you've uh, found, you know, way to, maybe the price of gasoline has gone down or price of electricity so that again for every unit of production the cost of production have gone down so at a particular price then you'd be willing to provide more uh, and able to provide more because you can cover those marginal costs. Another reason for supply curves to shift would be changes in government policies and you can imagine uh, maybe it's a regulation a new pollution control regulation that is going to require firms to do additional um, filtration or remediation of some of the um, you know pollution and products the toxic products that byproducts of, that they're producing from their process that would add additional costs that would be an upward shift in the supply curve similarly there's a you know let's say there's a new tax uh, for instance perhaps a carbon tax or something else on uh, the cost of energy that would shift the supply curve up the subsidies typically would go in the opposite direction and reduce the cost per unit uh, there can also be a shift due to changes in producer expectations. So if a producer thinks that the price will be higher next week, then they may temporarily hold off on providing supply now when the price is lower in anticipation of getting more revenue, more profit uh, later on once the price rises. So changes in expectations can definitely affect supply. Uh, and maybe the last one to mention is the number of producers. So if you can imagine um, overall within any market, the more producers that are in there, typically the more total supply you're going to have for any particular uh, price. Okay. So let's have a little self review here. So it's really important to get on top of these cost curves, understand their origins so, and so on. So what I suggest that you do, um, and it should help you in the event of an exam or just in the event that you happen to sit down on a bus next to an economist and want to strike up a conversation about supply and demand, um, draw the supply curve and understand what is on each axis, right? Take a, take a pen and label each axis, right? On the supply curve, you've got the, you know, price on the vertical axis and the quantity on the horizontal axis. Explain and understand why the supply curve is actually the marginal cost curve and specifically the upward uh, sloping section of the marginal cost curve. Um, does it slope up or down, right? Why? Okay, I'm going to leave that one to you. Um, what does it mean if the supply curve is steeper, less elastic, or flatter, more elastic? So I've covered that. You should be able to uh, articulate that. Uh, what does it mean if the supply curve is convex compared to linear? Okay, that means that the supply curve is curved as opposed to straight. And I'm not going to give it too much of help on that one besides to give you a hint that the elasticity of the supply curve when it's curved um, is different at different points of the curve, right? Certain sections of the curve are more or less elastic than other parts of the curve. Next, you should be able to say what causes a movement along the supply curve and also what causes the supply curve to shift 
in or out, and you know, depending on the slope, it might look like up or down instead. So that's what I wanted to cover in supply curves and uh, production functions and diminishing marginal productivity and uh, increasing marginal cost and so on. Uh, so hope that was useful, and I'll catch you later. Thanks.